Hi everyone, um, it's lovely to be here. Thank you for joining us over a lunch hour. Um, I get the really nice job of um, just sort of introducing the webinar and um, explaining how, how the session is, is going to pan out. So um, I'm Chief Executive here at IRISI. Um, I've been working in the VOG sector since 2004, gosh, um, and working on the healthcare response to VOG since 2007. Um, we just thought for some of you who are new to us, we would explain briefly who we are and what we do. So um, Iris I is a social enterprise and we were established in 2017. And our main focus is promoting and improving the healthcare response to domestic violence and abuse. We do this collaboratively um, with a network of partners who share our vision and have the drive to create sustained change. Um, and it's lovely, I can see lots of people saying hi in the chat to recognize so many friends and people who are delivering our programs, who we've been liaising with for many years, commissioners, healthcare professionals, and our fantastic partner provider agencies. So welcome everyone. Um, I think we've also got some survivors joining us as well. So everyone really, really welcome. Um, as I said, we work collaboratively with partners um, and we work around developing innovative evidence-based health interventions, um, also providing uh, expert uh, consultancy, training um, and advice in the field of uh, domestic violence, abuse and health. Um, we are, as far as we know, the only national organisation in our sector whose sole purpose is improving the healthcare response. Um, and we also, as far as we know, are the only national organisation working to scale up those interventions. Um, we're aware of some really great programmes working locally. We also work regionally and nationally. Um, so we're, we're delighted to have you all here with us today. You want to move me on, Charlotte, please? Thank you. Hello. So um, just a brief introduction on uh, the two interventions that, that we run. IRIS is our flagship programme, uh, commissioned in areas of England, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Channel Islands, with our guidance endorsed by the Royal College of General Practitioners. It's the gold standard programme for the healthcare response within uh, general practice. And we're really proud of some of our evidence base. Um, for example, a study in several areas of London showed that when compared with other programmes, IRIS generated 30 times more identifications and referrals. And that's really where we're hopefully heading over to the right hand side of this slide here, the similar sort of journey that we want to see for ADVISE, which is also research and evidence based. Our guidance is endorsed by BASH, the British Association of Sexual Health and HIV. And we hope now, working with, with your support, to be able to promote and scale this programme so we can see the same spread and uptake uh, nationally as we have with IRIS. So I'm really excited and encouraged that so many of you have joined us for this hour. Thank you being, for being part of the drive to further improve the healthcare response to gender-based violence, domestic abuse and sexual violence. And over to Charlotte now to share some of the advice work to date and the differences that the work in partnership with our health and specialist providers and collaborators is already making for clinicians and for patients. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you so much, Medina, for that lovely intro. Um, so I mentioned at the beginning that I'm the advise lead um, and senior regional manager. So my role is to look after the advise programme, to nurture it um, and hopefully to scale it up, as we've mentioned. Um, and I've been at IRSI myself for over a year and a half now. And when I joined, I was just so excited um, to join and be part of this programme because it felt really excited, exciting, innovative and new. Um, so I'd like to take you on a little bit of a tour around how we got to where we are now, where we would like to be. And we can't really do that without talking about IRIS. So as Medina has said, um, a general practice-based domestic violence and abuse training and referral programme. We help clinicians to recognise risk, check and ask, respond, refer and record. And it's that increasing in identification and referrals that improves clinical practice and can improve quality of life for patients. So the work that has already been done with IRIS is the building blocks essentially for what we're looking to do with ADVISE and what we've based that on. <clears throat> so just a little bit of background about the model. Um, so inputs, under there, we've got training and that ongoing support, care pathways, addition of medical record prompts, uh, the recording and flagging systems, 
and what we might call the marriage made in heaven. So the advocate educator, the person who's based within that domestic violence organisation, who has that dual role. So they train the clinicians and they also then support the people who are referred onto that programme. And they work really well alongside that clinical lead. So the clinical lead is based within that practice, within primary care, and they are able to co-deliver some of that training at the very beginning um, and also provide that advice and guidance and work alongside the advocate educator to get more clinicians on board. Um, and as we've talked about, that identification, referral, the advocacy um, and the outcomes that we might then see for patients. So that could be inc- improved quality of life, a reduction in abuse, increased safety. They're getting that support from the advocate educator and for the clinicians also. So an improved knowledge around DVA and the response, the provision of holistic care um, and making sure that those practices, because it's not just the clinicians that are, tra- are trained as part of the programme, but also the reception and admin staff also so that that practice um, is iris aware. Hmm. So for Iris, over 30,000 service users have been referred nationally. It's running in over 39 areas. This is from our previous national report. I know our new one is imminent, um, so we might have uh, a few more numbers in there. But also that we've looked into the investment um, and for each pound invested in the Iris programme, a social return of £10.71 was expected. Um, So really exciting, as Medina has said, that evidence base, that knowledge, because it's been running for a little bit more time. So what then have been the blocks and challenges for IRIS? Um, clinicians perhaps don't want to invest time if the programme isn't sustainable. So it's a lot of hard work to get a programme set up. Um, and what we want to see is sustainable um, funding to make sure that that hard work that goes in at the beginning um, is able to continue. Um, it might feel unfair if something's set up and then disappears, which is something that often happens around short term commissioning and funding cycles. Um, People might think that it's a good idea, but where's that ownership and who wants to pay, for example? So those are just some things that um, we've identified and that we've been able to think about that could be blocks and challenges, but especially when then developing that new programme we know about at the beginning. Okay, just a brief slide there when that might be a response that comes back to us saying that iris could be expensive. Um, But as we've talked about and shown, it provides that full intervention. So it's not just something like one-off training, which whilst it has its place, it's that all-around approach of training consultancy, embedding specialist knowledge and supporting patients along those new referral pathways that are created, providing value for money, you need to spend to save, and giving that local picture. So when working alongside IRISI to commission a programme in an area, we look at what's happening in that local area and how that might work. So moving on then to ADVISE, it's important to set the context with IRIS, but why are we here today? So ADVISE, which stands for Assessing for Domestic Violence and Abuse in Sexual Health Environments, our newest intervention to support sexual health clinicians to identify and respond to patients affected by domestic and sexual violence and abuse. So again, working on the IRIS model, we're facilitating referral to specialist support via a simple care pathway and adding capacity into local specialist third sector organisations. The trials back in 2015 took place in Hackney and Bristol and the real-world implementation followed. We believe we're meeting an unmet patient need, which we'll come on to talk about in some of our data later, um, and strengthening that local partnership work. So the first advice programmes began being rolled out in October 2021. Uh, One of the things that excited me personally about coming to work on Advise is that Advise is for everyone, um, so anyone can be referred and supported, and that we incorporate domestic violence and sexual violence in Advise, which is slightly different to IRIS. Um, So we'll talk a little bit more about what we've seen um, when Advise has been running in those areas shortly. So just an acknowledgement, I know we've got a real wide range of people here today, some of you from the health sector yourself, some of you perhaps not, Um, but why do we need that specific health sector response? And as Medina said, why are we so committed to making sure that people are thinking about domestic and sexual violence in that way, not just locally, but nationally? So we know and understand that domestic and sexual abuse is a violation of human rights. We know that there's evidence for effectiveness. We know and understand the health impact of abuse, and that can be physical health, but also mental health also, um, and survivors' expectations of healthcare professionals. We have some case studies and some quotes that we'll look at shortly, but the overwhelming majority of people are pleased to have been asked, um, regardless of if they go on to receive that support or not, knowing that someone is looking out, out for them and asking those questions makes people feel more confident about possible disclosures. 
And Chris, we touched base on some of those health impacts. Um, we touched on mental health. Um, so we know and understand that suffering from or experiencing domestic violence and sexual abuse can impact on all of these things and concern of physical health, mental health and family health. So when we've spoken with survivors, um, what is it that they say they'd like from healthcare professionals um, to feel comfortable and supported to disclose? An immediate response to that disclosure, also to be asked directly, um, that's really important, and a response in later consultations around continuity of care. And also from our work with clinicians, we understand that what they would like to know is a little bit more about the onward journey of that client. So making sure that the advocate educator is able to use that feedback loop to speak to that um, practitioner in sexual health about what has happened on that client's journey afterwards and what the impact was of asking that question um, and what support that client is now receiving. So just to touch base on the advised model, um, so these are some of the positives then that might happen for patients. So an improvement from accessing that earlier intervention, um, having that advocate educator embedded within sexual health services is really, really important. So that co-location. So in all of our sites, the advocate educators are based not just within the partner organisation, but in the clinic also as well, meaning that a client might make a disclosure and have access to the advocate educator that day. Improving safeguarding and safety um, and enabling victim survivors to have an increased understanding of what might constitute an unhealthy relationship. The clinicians and practices and um, to improve the quality of care for patients and not just from clinicians, as we've mentioned, from reception and admin staff as well. So everyone within that clinic having access to the package of training that we provide, creating those partnerships between specialists, so the clinicians and the advocate educators and improving that healthcare response, um, especially with things that pop up such as COVID by producing specific guidance and adapting our program also. And for commissioners, so helping local bodies to meet expectations and guidelines to develop coordinated commissioning strategies that include health um, and referral pathways, uh, particularly with advice for all patients affected by domestic violence and abuse. So to advise so far, so how are we doing, what are we doing and where are we doing it? So currently our advise programme is running uh, with four partner organisations in four areas of Greater Manchester. We're also running in Bristol and South Gloss, Bristol being one of our pilot sites, uh, and also running in two London boroughs also. And as Medina mentions, we have plans to grow and upscale just like Iris. Now, I went onto our Oasis system this morning to double check, uh, and we have a few more. So the total referrals so far that we have for this program is 794, uh, which is amazing. I remember when I first started in person, I was so pleased that we were getting to 100. Um, so that feels really, really exciting. Uh, the total number of advised trained staff, so that's clinical and admin, is now over 150. Um, because Manchester has been running, so Greater Manchester has been running for more time than our other areas, we ran a launch event and we also have an evaluation document as well, which is great and can be circulated after this to share in a little bit more detail around what's been going well in Manchester. Uh, we've seen clear evidence that the model works and that we're reaching service users that no one else is. And that was one of the really exciting things for working with advice, particularly and in sexual health. We know from Iris that we often reach a certain demographic of people who really access their GP. We know that Iris is developed with the evidence based women um, and the people who tend to go to their practice tend to be older. With advice, what we're seeing is we're seeing a lot of a younger cohort. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that data shortly. But that feels really exciting. And also a lot of the cohorts who are saying they haven't ever accessed services before. So we want to continue to tweak and refine the pilot. That's something we're excited to do also. So I'm going to run you through a little bit of the data and our findings so far with a bit of a caveat um, about how we've come to this. That's really important. So if I move us on to this one, so just a little bit about referrals and referrals over time. So we were, we're working on our national report, so we'll have more detail about advice specifically. But in the meantime, Iris, I wanted to really look at what had been happening so far where it had been happening and be able to finally compare two of the areas because they've been running then concurrently for a year, which was really exciting. So we were able to use data from the four Manchester areas um, and Bristol and South Gloss um, for a specific period of time. So one year um, where they ran 
for that one year at the same time. So that's the kind of data that we're going to be looking at today. This is phase one of a project that we're doing. For phase two, we'd like to also then be given the clinic data so that we can really drill into is this typical data for the people who are attending the clinic um, and kind of go into a, a deeper dive. So watch this space for that. But in the meantime, some of the things that have come out from this are so exciting and interesting that we wanted to share them with you now. Um, just also as a caveat, so the numbers that we're working with on each one might be slightly different, um, but this is all data that we've pulled from our OASIS system. So this is data that the advocate educators have entered into our system. And this slide just shows that that kind of skew about where that data might be coming from, just so that you can get an understanding. <clears throat> Fabulous. So this histogram here is showing the advised cohort skews younger than the populations of the commissioned areas. And we've checked this against the census median areas. Um, and this is before we account for the fact that advisors 16 plus. Um, oh, gosh, sorry, I've skipped us on to the next one. Now. So, yeah, so this is really exciting. We're looking at much younger cohort as we might have seen with Iris. So again, although we've used the building blocks from Iris, we know and understand that it works. And we've got that evidence base by transferring into sexual health. We're seeing something slightly different. And again, once we've got that clinic data, it would be really good to be able to compare that too. Here, I'm just going to move us on to our gender and sexuality slide. So the advised cohort is more trans, more queer than the national cohort, which again feels really exciting. I guess we'd, we'd guess that this matches the sexual health clinic attendees. But again, with that data, we'd be able to explore it a little bit more. Um, and for those who disclose, because this is where the data come from, for those who disclose to the advocate educator, heterosexuality for the three areas um, hovers at between 92 and 97 percent, whereas with our advised cohort, that's 71 percent. And that's using data compared to the 2021 census data. So we're seeing people coming through the sexual health side with advice um, who are identifying in that way, which is exciting. Um, and again, because that program is open to everyone, um, that means that our advocate educators are able to support more people um, in various different ways. Just a little breakdown about who is referring um, when we are accepting those referrals into the service. So we are getting a real range. The vast majority of people who are referring are doctors and nurses, but a real range of different kind of specialisms and practices there. Um, a fair few under other that could be reception and admin training, or it could be people with just a slightly different job role. Um, but it's just interesting to see a little bit about where the majority of those referrals are coming from. And this one, again, is really interesting. So around this one shows clearly that the majority of people coming through the service, so that's 60 percent, um, had not ever tried to seek support before. So, again, that's evidencing an unmet need and the benefits of this early intervention. Um, and that's something we'd like to kind of look at and monitor going forward. But again, it feels like that access to an earlier intervention um, is just really promising. And just this slide here around mental ill health. So two thirds of patients um, who are then referred into advice disclose some form of mental ill health um, and only 117, so 36% of those had a diagnosis. Okay, and I mentioned that the advice programme is um, for domestic violence and sexual violence, um, which was a change from the IRIS programme. So this one just breaks down and lets you know that the majority of on the reason for referrals isn't sexual violence. So these people might not have been picked up through SARCs, for example. So I think it might be a little bit small for you to see, but domestic violence there is in blue. Domestic violence and sexual violence is in orange and sexual violence is in grey. What we have seen um, is that often what might happen is someone is referred for domestic violence, for example. We know obviously that there's overlaps, um, but that then there might be a secondary referral once someone has been referred and is receiving that support that they might then feel safe enough to disclose a second referral there. And that might then be around sexual violence. Okay, and this one is about perpetrator information, and we want to get a little bit better at recording that because it's very, very interesting. But this data proves that although we've widened the client cohort to include people of all genders, um, overwhelmingly perpetrators remain male and victims remain a female. So that proves the importance of applying that gendered lens um, and just really highlights that that 
yeah, that, that's really important. Um, you can see there with the figures that it's 93%, uh, 93.7% 93 um, of total referrals we have received have been a female victim with a male perpetrator. Um, and just along the bottom there, it says that, again, the vast majority of people who refer to suffering from or experiencing intimate partner violence there as well. Okay, so I've talked you through all of those. Um, I think it might be nice to just mention a little bit about who it is that we've then supported on this journey. So I'm just going to give a couple of highlights to, to highlight, you know, how different everyone is that we've managed to support. So the first um, one I'll mention is Sarah. So she's a 33-year-old woman with a seven-year-old daughter. Um, and she came to us and disclosed that there'd been non-recent um, domestic and sexual violence, which meant that actually she might not have been able to find support from a traditional domestic violence agency. We were able to provide her a range of support that she wouldn't have had if she hadn't been asked that question when she came to see her sexual health permission. We've also supported Andrea, who was a social worker who felt unable to access support through the traditional methods because she was worried about being outed when she was supporting people who might be experiencing similar, similar things to her. And she expressed surprise and shock that when she was asked the question and she broke down in the clinic in the clinician's room, that she was able to get exactly the kind of support that it was that she needed. So that longer term support that we're able to offer on these programs, that does cover things that are non-recent also. We then also supported Jamie, who's 31 and non-binary and came to us through the trans clinic. We supported them in various different ways, but also around their tenancy, which was really important. Um, and in terms of keeping themselves safe and understanding and processing a little bit about what had happened to them. And they said that the report that they received was really exactly what they needed at the time and that they felt really safe when they had when they met their advocate educator and that the support that they received was exactly what was needed. We also supported a 57 year old male who was an ex army um, who was who had been previously in the army and um, who'd suffered a recent sexual assault um, and accessed support through the SARC and then was able to access support through us. And when they came to our service, they were really, really, really concerned um, and really so profoundly overwhelmed with all of the things that had happened that they felt that they were unable to continue um, and they were able to speak with their advocate educator who came to them with a plan, some help and some understanding and they were able to disclose to some family members who were then able to support them um, alongside that process and that process did include reporting to the police um, and continuing to receive support through their advocate educator also. So a lot of a lot of stuff there in those case studies. Um, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. We have so many case studies that are longer. I have had case studies written in clients' own words um, about the support that they have received. But what feels really interesting about advice is the range of service users that we have been able to support with the range of issues and needs that they have. And that as a programme, we're committed to ensuring that our advocate educators have a lot of training also to make sure that they're able to provide the best support that they can. OK, so just to follow on a little bit from that, we've got some quotes here from patients who've experienced the advice service. So someone said that they feel that they can start imagining what the future could be like. Um, this one in the middle is really powerful. So I've been asked about sexual violence before by the GP, but I didn't feel comfortable telling them. When I was asked at the sexual health clinic, I felt more confident that they would understand because it is to do with my sexual health. And the first one, it's been nice to have someone I can speak to who I've been able to trust. Someone who's been able to tell me that it's not been my fault and that I'm not going mad, but it was my ex's behaviour that was wrong and that was making me feel that way. I'm now much better, I'm now better able to understand how much he controlled and abused me. And some clinicians as well. So if advice did disappear, it would leave a big hole. Um, and someone else said that they'd be devastated to lose it. And this one here in the middle. The fact that we can refer across such a range of issues, rape and domestic violence, but also grooming, and men as well as women. Previously, I'd have suggested rape crisis or the SARC and said, take a photo of this number. Having advice is completely different. You're saying, I can refer you to the advocate educator. She works here. She really knows her stuff on this. It's a person, not a helpline. And you feel so much more confident about encouraging someone. 
And I think that's what makes advice different from anything else. It, like you said, it's not a one-off training. It's a combination of so many different things. It's that training, it's that advocate educator, it's training not only clinicians, it's training everyone involved within that clinic. It's making sure that those relationships are key with those referral pathways and really embedding those relationships into practice. So we ask, <laughs> and why we've got you all here today. So we want to continue to grow our newest intervention, but we do need your help. So today is our step one of this. So we're able to share a little brief piece of our findings with a wide network, including those on the ground closest to the work, and also with those with access to those with influence. So my vision and mission, vision and mission, which we talked about at the start, is to match the reach of IRIS and be able to use the evidence and experiences of both from more and more sites to paint a national picture. So the ask for you today is can you talk to your colleagues about advice and what you've heard here today? Can you think about where advice could work if that's in your local area or an area that's close to you? Can you get in touch and schedule a meeting with me if you think that this is something that survivors in your area might need? Or if you've got any questions or something that has come up today that you want to know a little bit more about? Do you have any publications, meetings and events where we could share info about advice? And finally, do you have any burning questions? Thank you. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and then we're going to go over to the chat and see if we have any questions there that we might then be able to answer. I'm just going to stop sharing here. Um, we have got one question in the chat so far. Feel free, um, everyone, to start popping them if you want. I'll, I'll keep an eye on them. But um, Charlotte, we've got a question uh, about the costing for advice and how we might cost up a programme. Yeah, of course. So as we kind of mentioned, each area will be very different. And that's part of what we do here at Iris Eye. So if there was interest from a particular site or a particular area, um, as Iris Eye, we have a network and we have regional managers and each regional manager might look at a different area or a different cluster of sites. So if someone was interested, you could make an inquiry through our website um, and then we would get in touch and we'd find out a little bit more about the footprint of that site and how that might work, because it's based on lots of different things, such as how many people might access that sexual health clinic, what that might look like, how many staff there are and things like that that would be then tailored to that particular area. So if it is something that someone is interested in, then please do get in touch. And that's part of our role is to look at how that could work. Thank you. Carla, I wonder if it's worth, um, as we're talking about finances and cost, um, I think it's fine to share because it's public money in the public domain, how our current sites are funded, who are funding those, and um, just to sort of share that information might be useful for people on the call. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So it, it does vary. But for example, our newest London sites um, are funded by the VRE. So that's the Violence Reduction Unit, and we're working with them. Um, to manage those London sites um, and to, we've got two year funding with the VRU for London um, for us to implement that programme and also that's an evaluation as part of that as well because that's what we're really keen um, to stress is that we're still learning so we're still learning in all of our sites um, and that we'd like to be able to share the results of those evaluations with you when they come through also. Thank you. Um, we've got another question from Rebecca who's asking about advice in Wales. Is it delivered in Wales at the moment? Um, or if not, are there plans to deliver in Wales? <laughs> Absolutely, there's plans to, <laughs> but it's not delivered there at the moment, but it's definitely something that we would like to discuss further because we run Iris in a lot of sites in Wales um, and we run Iris very well and we've run Iris for quite some time in a lot of those sites. Something that has worked quite well in the advice sites that we do have is that they're based in places where we have had Iris and that means that people know and understand that the programme works and they've got a little bit of understanding about um, the processes and things like that. So that's definitely something we've been looking to explore. I'm also keen to run a programme in a place where there isn't iris to see how that might work, because that might be slightly different. Um, but absolutely, um, if you have any contacts or knowledge about people in Wales who might be interested, um, then that's definitely something that we can explore. Medina. Sorry, me again, just jumping in. Um, I can see we've got some Welsh colleagues here. Hi, Lisa. I can see we've got Atala Fro um, represented here, and I'm sure we've got some other Welsh colleagues here too. Um, just to flag something really exciting, we've actually got a um, higher. <laughs> we've actually got a um, 
uh, a round table with Welsh Government tomorrow um, to talk about our IRIS programme. So IRIS is running in six out of the seven health board areas in Wales, not full coverage, but also one of the asks and one of the things that I will talk about then is that, you know, as well as work in general practice, we want to be um, expanding across um, other areas of the health sector across our nation, not only in England and Wales. So, um, yeah, good question. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. I was just replying to a question from um, Hermela. I'll, I'll continue that, Hermela, in a moment. Um, there's been another comment that says we have a VPU in Wales that may be a way in. Also, sexual violence is a policing priority in Wales at the moment. So, yeah, similar to what you've just been saying. Um, and I'm happy to share um, my email address in the chat as well if people want to kind of further those discussions. And also something I know one of our asks was, do you know anyone? Have you thought about things? We have recently worked together with over 70 um, organisations within the VORC sector um, to come together and pull together our election manifesto. So you might not have seen that yet, but we've got the link. We can put it in the chat. And Iris and Advise are actually named, I think it's section six, um, which is around uh, health and care. So we have been, our programmes have actually been named um, as a recommendation for best practice. Um, so again, that's something that's really helpful to see what's happening in the vault sector. So we can share that link. I think Mel's probably doing it now. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I think you're on mute. I've done the classic meeting and talking away, haven't I? <laughs> um, a question from Rachel's just been put in. Uh, given funding from VRUs, perhaps a serious violence duty could be an option to fund pilots uh, locally in the next financial year. Um, yeah, absolutely, Rachel. And there's quite a lot um, of kind of health responsibilities within the serious violence duty as well um, to be addressing violence against women and girls. So, yeah. Right. Medina? Just on that serious violence duty um, point as well. Yes, we work very closely with the domestic abuse and sexual violence team at NHS England, headed up by Catherine Hinwood. Um, and I know that a lot of the information that she and her team have been putting out, certainly in the in most recent months, has been about the um, certainly in England, the integrated care boards um, systems and partnership requirements to respond to the serious violence duty. So we're also interested in the updates to the um, uh, joint forward plans that are now being put forward, again, being revised um, within NHSE and Catherine and her team are making sure that there is content around that, um, of course, around domestic abuse and sexual violence. So we'll be trying as part of my role at IRISI to sort of leverage that at, at, at national level as much as we can. Thanks for that, Rachel. Lisa, you have a question. Not, not a question, really. Um, more of a comment. And um, it's just to say that you know, that was a really good presentation, Charlotte. So thanks for sharing that with us. I'm really excited about where advice has gone and where it can go in the future. And um, coming from someone that has had input with Iris right from its inception way back many, many years ago. <laughs> in covering Cardiff and the Vale and the difference that we can see Iris has made to the number of referrals coming through those first time disclosures to have another branch of that within sexual health I think is 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 amazing and I'm really excited to see where we can bring that in in Wales mm. and how we can how we can further develop it so no question just a comment <laughs> Oh, how lovely. Thank you so much, Lisa. I really appreciate that. I'm really excited too. Yeah. Now I've done the presentation, I'm even more excited. Um, but it definitely feels slightly different. So it feels like sexual health is is different. Um, and that's exciting. Um, and there's lots of knowledge already about sexual violence, for example, but perhaps less about domestic violence. And it's about making that work. So I think we've definitely used the building blocks of Iris, but there will be some tweaks and changes for advice, but that's OK. Um, and Mel and I are part of our role. So Mel is not only managing the chat today, she is also so the Iris lead nationally um, and part of our jobs together is to work on updating those materials so to make sure that they're as up to date as possible so that new laws and legislation as part of that gets fed down to that AE network um, and all of those AEs across all of the all of the nations as Medina said um, are getting access to that and making sure that they're at the top of their knowledge as well so thank you so much um, and yes I'll hopefully meet you soon I'm sure <laughs> in real life <laughs> thank you
Um, there's just been a comment from Julie in the chat about the presentation and whether or not we're able to share that afterwards. Yes, I think we absolutely are. I just need to send a version that doesn't have my notes all over it. So watch this space. I think when we ask people to register for this, we asked if people were happy to be contacted. Um, so we will have that list um, and then we can make sure we share it in that way. Um, we can potentially, I don't know if we can, Charlotte, but I've just made a note about the, the Manchester evaluation and our latest national report that's due to come out around the kind of 16 days of activism. So um, we can hopefully share that with everyone who's on this link as well, if you sign up to mailing. Yeah, absolutely. And I mentioned that we ran that event in Manchester earlier, and that was after a year of embedding the programme with the four different areas that we were working with. And we had the deputy mayor come along to talk about advice as well. And the excitement there was infectious as well. So there's a couple of cross pieces that we can link to and that Manchester evaluation. Um, lots of things that we encountered, lots of tweaks that we were able to make. Um, but then the more places that join us get the benefit of that knowledge that we've learned from those pilot sites so they've worked very very hard um, and hopefully each time that we launch we'll know a little bit more and we'll be able to be a little bit you know be able to tweak those things a little bit more as well thank you uh we've had a couple of other things dropped in um marianne has asked <clears throat> about connecting around data and training uh marianne is at the institute for addressing strangulation great to have you marianne we've had some links with the institute already so really lovely to have you represented um she said we're trying to get a full picture of the prevalence of strangulation in domestic abuse and sexual violence across england and wales and developing clinical guidelines related to strangulation it'd be really important to share um with practitioners yeah particularly i guess around perhaps the rates that we might have had in our referrals from advice where sexual violence has been present um i don't know what you think charlotte but perhaps it's worth us connecting with marianne offline to talk a little bit more about that because that's really interesting yeah definitely and that's definitely something that we've built into our data system also so we're explicitly asking um and obviously there's free form text and things like that as well but we should have we will have data about that yeah and it's definitely something that clinicians really want to know more about and are really keen to understand you know there's all, there's so many topics that could be you know much longer I think I'm so proud of our training that we give to clinicians because it's two and a half full-on days it's a lot um, and then, you know that's a lot to train and that's a lot of information to receive but we consistently get great feedback from clinicians about the pace and the content and about how we've thought about things but there's so many topics such as NFS that we could do a whole day on also so it's kind of getting that balance right but definitely there's a hunger for more knowledge um, from all of the clinicians that we're working with. Great. Um, thanks, Marin. I've just seen your email address in there as well. We'll make sure we connect with you. Uh, we had another question from Rachel that has asked about um, pre-prepared business cases and templates that can be shared to argue the benefits for IRIS or advised models. Um, I guess I can touch a bit on IRIS and then pass to you, Charlotte, for advise. Um, we're in the process, actually. We've got a lot of commissioning guidance for um, IRIS programs that um, we can absolutely share with people. We'll both make sure, or I'll make sure that I pop both mine and Charlotte's email addresses in the chat um, so that you can take those in a second and, and kind of reach out and get in touch with us. I'm also in the process of developing a commissioning pack for IRIS. So we do have template business cases that we've put together for existing IRIS sites to help them with recommissioning um, and links to a lot of kind of policy and evidence that can be referenced not only in terms of where IRIS is recognised as best practice, but where health sectors particularly have a duty to address all in the VOL commissioning guidance, in the Domestic Abuse Act, serious violence duty that's been referenced already. So um, we can absolutely help with building those business cases and we can help with kind of proofreading those as well. Um, we'll also, as Charlotte did for um, IRIS, uh, as well as advise, help with budgeting and kind of the modelling for how much that's going to cost, what needs to be included etc so um yeah i'll let charlotte answer from the advice perspective and i'll pop both of our emails in the chat um we can always always happy to meet with people and share what our kind of processes are and what we're able to provide support wise 
Thanks, Mel. And not not much to add. I think with Advise, we we have, as we said, built a lot on what's happened with Iris. So we're much newer. So we might not have as much of that evidence base yet, but there is some. Um, so we include all of those as well. Um, and yeah, we've got, as we've said, examples of our best practice in other areas and examples of um, relationships and press releases and things like that and endorsements. Um, it's definitely something that I'm looking to um, develop as part of my um, role over the next year about more endorsements endorsements about understanding um, and getting other people to recognize um, not only the quality of the training as we've mentioned about but you know the the quality of referrals and the quality of outcomes for survivors as well so at the moment I've been doing some work with the Faculty of Sexual and Reproductive Health um, if anyone subscribed to their blogs and their um, their, their um, blog posts that come out every couple of months I'm currently writing one for their next one um, so part of my mission and part of why we set this up is to spread that good word and like we said we need a little bit of your help but if you know people who are um, you know putting things like that out um, who'd like to know more than absolutely that will all then go into things like those recommissioning packs because that's an example of where we've been published and things like that thank you Lisa you've got your hand up again I do. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a bit more of a talker rather than a typer. So if I've got anything to say, I normally just verbalise it rather than type it. No so apologies for that. And just, um, just a, a thought, really. We've got, um, we're holding a, a conference in, in, in Cardiff City Stadium for National Safeguarding Week mm. on the 17th of November for Cardiff in the Vale. Um, the topic being exploitation. So I'm just wondering, Charlotte, if you want me to link you in with anybody from the Task and Finish group. Yeah. Are we yeah. going to be holding a, a, a stand there within within the main kind of centre for that? And I have invited the Irish workers from Cardiff in the Vale to kind of come along and share that table with us to promote Iris. Yeah. But if there's anything you want kind of to, for me to do advice, what, advice wise or promote yeah. that there, put you in contact with anybody from the Task and Finish group for the, as part of the National Safeguarding Week. I'm more than happy to. Amazing. I will take you up on that. That would be great. Thank you so much. And definitely in terms of exploitation, that's something that what we're seeing advocate educators report um, is that there's a lot of work um, with vulnerable adults. There's a lot of work and crossover there around adults um, who are sex working and things like that, um, who are then maybe coming into sexual health clinics because they're being really proactive about their sexual health, which is great, but they're not going to be doing that with the GP or anywhere else. So we've got different clients than we would see yeah. with Iris um, and perhaps clients who perhaps would be more vulnerable to exploitation. So, yeah. Yeah, that would be great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and just that that goes both ways. So with our advise advocate educators, we've got we've had training on things like chemsex. We've had training on the different kind of client groups that we might work with. And often because part of RSI is building that network. So we recently had our network day where advocate educators from all over were able to come with us and meet. Um, that knowledge feeds back into IRIS program as well. So although we've we've taken a lot uh, from the building blocks, we're kind of giving stuff back because we've expanded a little bit and we're we're working with different client groups and that knowledge can then expand into our IRIS line network as a whole as well. So it's good, symbiotic. Thank you. I think just to add to that, Charlotte, um, what we have seen and you will have, Charlotte touched on it briefly in, in the data that she shared, is that actually having advice and iris programs operating in the same areas works as a really wonderful partnership to kind of capture clients from all different kind of um, backgrounds and identities where there might be some lack in general practice advise is definitely kind of capturing that client base or even you heard in those case studies where perhaps some clients might um, be too nervous or anxious or for whatever reason, the general practice might, might not be accessible to them, but sexual health feels far more accessible. It's then kind of capturing that patient group as well. So um, they definitely work hand in hand in a, in a really lovely way. Thanks, Mel. Uh, there's no other questions in the chat for the moment, but I don't know if anyone wants to kind of pop a hand up or unmute and ask for anything. You're welcome to do that too. I'm just noticing while people are having a think and not to put you on the spot if you don't want to pop up and say anything. But um, I've just noticed that one of the people involved in the very, very beginning stages of our advice pilot, Pavan, is on the call. Um, and um, it's it's just lovely to see sort of people working with us throughout the whole journey. So, Pavan, if you're feeling brave and fancy saying hi or um, 
mentioning anything about, you know, all those years ago when we had this sort of idea for my an adaptation of Iris work. Um, be lovely to hear from you. Um, otherwise, just just really nice to have you on the on the meeting today. And I think as well, um, Lisa, as you were saying, in terms of sort of adapting Iris and moving from our what we're really well known for our general practice work into other areas of the health system. Um, these are sort of our, our, our first two um, programmes, obviously. And um, just to talk a little bit more about our wider work, um, we have an ambition to sort of spread throughout um, as many areas of the health uh, sector as we can. So um, we will be piloting some work in um, working with health visitors funded by colleagues and funders. I can see hi, Nikisha um, from the Violence Reduction Unit in London. Um, with their support, we're going to be piloting that. Um, we're building on some research work that we did with both Bristol and Manchester Dental Schools some years ago to think about an adapted approach in dentistry and also thinking about work around um, uh, maternal mental health with our colleagues at the um, wonderful um, Maternal Mental Health Association and wider and wider. So our ambition doesn't stop at general practice and at sexual health. So if any of those things that I've mentioned are interest, of interest, please um, contact Mel um, or Charlotte, or if you have any other ideas for other areas of health that perhaps you're running a service where your support workers are being overrun by demands from a certain part of health and you're not getting resourced for that, that's what we're about. Um, yes, we have to charge for what we do so that we can help scale up and promote what we do. Um, but we're mostly about working with organisations to attract local funding to develop and implement and capacity build locally. So when we talk about the local workers and working in partnership, the funding that we work in partnership with you all to get, the majority of that is funding for local specialist frontline VORG services. We're passionate about supporting our amazing local service providers. Um, Mel, Charlotte and I and most of uh, the wonderful women in our team are from that background. So, you know, we get it. We know it's hard. And we also have worked a long time within within health and we understand the pressures that, that colleagues in health are under. So it's that collaboration and that partnership that we hope supports from every direction um, to, to, to make the system work better for the patients and survivors who are all here to, to best support. Thank you so much, Medina. Really, really lovely wrapping and summing up as well. Um, so it doesn't look like there's any more questions. Um, we've popped our email addresses, as, as we've said, in the chat. And hopefully this session was a useful introduction um, to where we've got to with Advise and where we'd like to go. As mentioned, I'm more than happy to follow that up with anyone um, if they want to know a little bit more, if they want to drill a bit more down, or if there's any requests about anything that we've mentioned today. Um, I think most of it is now in the chat. Um, but yes, thank you again so much for giving up your lunch hour. Um, and we'll hang around shortly at the end if anyone did have any questions they didn't want to share in the big group. Um, but apart from that, thank you so much. Lovely to meet you. And hopefully I'll get to meet some more of you soon so I can wax lyrical about advice some more. Thank you so much.